In verse 15, Luke 15, it says, The prodigal son went and joined himself to a citizen of the country, and he sent him into the field to feed pigs. Now what they fed them in famine times were carob pods. There was nothing else left. They broke the carob pods off the trees, and that was famine food. And the rabbis used to say, when Israel is in famine, they will eat pig food and carob food. And this is exactly what Jesus is quoting from, the old rabbi saying. And they knew what he was talking about. And they identified with what he said. Now look what he says here. When he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my father's have bread enough and to spare, and I am perishing with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against you and before heaven and earth. I am no more worthy to be called your son. Just make me a servant. That will be sufficient. So he got up and he came to the father. And we were singing this this morning. While he was a great way off, the father saw him, had compassion, and ran to him, embraced him, and said, now look what he said, bring forth the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. I would like to talk today about when a church goes through restoration, one of the most wonderful things that can ever happen is... When you learn to wash each other's feet, you come back from straying. This is where we've been. You've come from being a broken vessel. You're being put back together. And if you'd like to look at that vase right in the middle, some of you have been so shattered that you may not be totally back together. And it may not ever quite be like it would have been a perfect vessel. But God even takes broken vessels and he delights in using that which is broken. And one day when we stand before the Lord, look at that top vase you will be so healed and restored, it will be as if you had never sinned. Won't that be fantastic? Justified, just as if I had never sinned. We looked last week at David. And in Samuel, we saw that when, from man's point of view, every sad detail of his life and the fall, the adultery, the murder, the lying, the repentance is all recorded. But when God wants to record his truth, he writes another book called Chronicles. The early Jews had four books of kings, what we call 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, 1 Kings, and 2 Kings. They called 1 Kings, 2, 3, and 4 Kings. But Chronicles is written from this wonderful point of view. He only records that when David tarried in Jerusalem, it cost him time, opportunity. And when God writes the record over your life, isn't that a fabulous thought? that when you stand before the Lord Jesus, what is under the blood of Christ will not be bought up. Do you realize one day when you stand before the Lord, and Gary and I were just talking about before, when you are in the resurrection, you'll be so clean and so right with God, God will not be digging up your sins because you will have overcome and you'll have been at the beamer seat of Christ, at the judgment seat of Christ, and in that day you shall have praise of God. Do you know one of the most wonderful things about life is that sometimes we don't always do everything right. But God looks at the heart and why you do things. And if you can do them from integrity of heart, God takes that as the prime thing that he judges. Some of the greatest failures of the past will be those who will be the wisest in the years to come. I'm going to say it again. Some have been most deceived. They'll become strongest. Those who have followed wisdom's voice will not easily be distracted. I won't ask for a show of hands, but how many folk have learned some hard lessons and now you're a little bit smarter for it. And you've said in your heart, God, I'm going to follow you with more wisdom than ever before. Do you know, I remember saying to the Lord once when I got caught and I got a speeding ticket. <laughs> and as I got pulled over and I said to the cop, fair enough, you caught me fair and square. I put out my hand and I said, may I just say thank you? And he looked at me absolutely appalled because nobody's ever thanked him for a speeding ticket before. And I said, thank you for reminding me that I should drive as though God was watching what I'm doing and my congregation are watching what I'm doing. And you know what he said to me when he pulled me up? All right, what are you, a minister or a doctor? Isn't that a sad thing for a have a reputation? Ministers in a hurry, doctors in a hurry. And as I drove away, I said to the Lord, Lord, what is wrong with my love for you? That I cannot obey the law of the lands. If you love me, keep my commandments. So a little bit chastened, a little bit smarter, and a little bit wiser. I've got to that stage in life now where I realize 
Holiness is nothing to do with the law. It's everything to do with love. Some preachers preach holiness and you go away fearing it and not loving it. But if I can just show you that holiness is one of the most wonderful things you could ever have in your life. It's that instant obedience when you want to please yourself or you want to please God. And you know what I said to the Lord the other day when I was tempted? And none of you are interested in what I was tempted on, are you? No? Okay. We'll leave that alone. But I said to the Lord, because love covers a multitude of sins, doesn't it? Yes. I said to the Lord, I would rather please you than please myself. And that's changing me. I would rather please the Lord than please myself. Taken a while to get there. But everybody here looks so holy, I'll just move right on. David got off the throne. He throws his crown on the floor. And he says, I have sinned against God. And David got down before God. And Nathan said, David, God has put away the act of your sin. He has covered it, he has cleansed it, and you are right with God. There's a price to pay for what you've done, family, kingdom, and what have you. And one day you'll see your wives trashed in front of the whole kingdom of Israel. How would you like that? Would you imagine your partner being trashed in front of a town? Like, remember how they used to put fools in stocks? And they would put them in with a head like that, and people could throw rocks and rubbish and trash at them? What a price. But you know one thing I've learned? It is not the perfection of David's performance. It's the set of his heart towards God. And aren't you glad about that? And every time you've ever struggled against your sin, God knows why. And if our heart condemns us, you know what John says? Let me come to the New Testament. God is greater than our hearts. And he knows all things. Isn't that comforting? that when you've done something wrong, God even knows why you've done it wrong. And if you've been so trashed as a child, you cannot stop a repeat pattern in your heart, God can still set you free. Did anybody see in the paper the other day, uh, the lady who's the most beautiful lady in the world and supposed to be the most famous actress, and her sister is on drugs and she just committed suicide. But I'll tell you what, and I'm not saying you should suicide, I wonder if God even understands a person who's been so trashed so broken, so collapsed under drugs and so smashed as a child that he even understands when somebody does the last desperate act. Now, don't take me too far on that one. Catholic wise, they say it's an unforgivable sin. Protestant wise, we don't seem to have a ruling on that one. So I'm not saying out, go commit harikari and get to heaven early. Please don't take me wrong. But what I am saying, I'm taking the extremest example I can think of and I think even God can understand when somebody does something like that. Only God knows, and aren't you glad that you don't have to judge that one? Today, what I'd like to talk about is just a short message. I'd like to talk about walking white with God. Now, that's not me with a bad saying, I can't say the letter R. It is walking right, but I want you to walk white. In Zechariah chapter 3, would you like to turn to me, uh, turn with me to that one? You'll find it in the Old Testament. You've got to go to Matthew, flip back three books. That's probably the easiest way to find it. So go back Malachi and just go back the 12 chapters, flip back two books. Here's an amazing passage. Now, what I want to do today is tell you what's happening behind the scenes when you get tempted to sin. And when the devil comes up against you and tries to drag you back. Here is an amazing chapter that gives us an insight like Job had of what was happening behind the scenes when Job was getting tempted. Haggai, the previous prophet, has got a job about building the temple and saying, not time to stay in your own houses, let's build the house of God. Zechariah, on the other hand, has an insight into what's happening behind the scenes. Now listen very carefully. Joshua is the high priest. This is not Joshua the man who brought them into the land of promise. This is a Joshua many hundreds of years later called the high priest. They've just come back from 70 years of captivity in Babylon. And their job is to build the temple and rebuild Israel. And they lay the foundations and then they stop. And for 15 years, they build their own houses. They look after their own shops, their businesses. 
and people are standing up and saying, this is the word of the Lord, it is not yet time to build the house of the Lord. And somehow Joshua buys into this. And for 15 years, he sits still. And it gets to such a point that his walk with God is compromised. And look at verse 1 with me. The Lord showed Zechariah, Joshua the high priest. He was standing before the angel of the Lord. This is Jesus Christ, the angel of the Lord. And Satan is standing at his right hand to resist him. How do you work that one out? How come God can let the devil into a church? Hmm. I haven't got a clue. How come you can sit here with all your battles and struggles, so can I, and while you're worshipping, the devil's putting into your heart, you're not good enough to worship. Do you realize what you did this last week? And what about what you did and what you did and what you did? You know that's not God, is it? That's the devil. How does it work? I haven't got a clue. But I know it happens. When you get depressed, that's not Jesus Christ. That's not the Holy Spirit. Now, it may be a chemical thing, and you may have eaten gluten, and you're depressed if you, have to, if you eat mixed glu- grains. Let's put aside the naturopathic stuff for a while. It could be exactly what is happening here. And Satan is standing at his right hand to resist him. Literally in the Hebrew it said, Satan was standing at his right hand to Satanize him. We would have to translate it, the adversary was standing at his right hand to be adverse to him. Have you ever gone to court and had a smart lawyer and they've just shredded every case? That's exactly the situation here. This is a lawyer who's got all the dirt. What does the Bible say about Satan in the New Testament? He is your adversary. And when you sin, what is Jesus' great answer to this? If we sin, we have a better lawyer than he is. He is our advocate. And if you look at Zechariah 3, the Lord says to Satan, The Lord rebuke you, O Satan. Even the Lord that hath chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. This is a brand plucked from the burning. Two things. God has a plan for Jerusalem. Joshua, you are part of that plan. The devil wants to stop Jerusalem getting rebuilt. He wants to stop the nation of the Jews coming back to serve God. By the way, it's the same thing today. And the church that blesses Israel will be blessed of the Holy Spirit. Peace be on Israel and peace be on those who pray for the blessing on Jerusalem. And I think one of the great things a church could ever do is be involved in missions to help the Jewish people find Christ. God has a plan for Jerusalem. He isn't finished yet. The Gentile church hasn't replaced the Jewish people. But we will be built together as one and one day we'll be stand before God and the Lord says we shall be one and one body. Fantastic time. And he says, I've got a plan for Jerusalem. I'm going to use Joshua, and he is a brand plucked from the burning. Now, I want you to imagine that this is a brand that was lit. It was on top with bits of fuel, and this is the last piece of the handle. It's burnt right down to the stump, but there's enough timber left. The heart is still good, even though the outside has been burnt. Have you ever met a Christian who's been so fragmented and so burnt by life We would despair of uh, even having seen coming out of their life. But God looks on the heart and he says, the stick is sound, it's a brand plucked from the burning, I've got it out just in time and I'm going to use a burnt stick to show you just how good I am at taking broken people. And when we look around us as a congregation, preacher included, God has snatched us from the burning and he's built us into the kingdom of God. And this is what's happening behind the scenes. He is about to serve God. But the devil doesn't want to get him serving God. He's held him back for 15 years, stopping building the house of God, which was part of the economy of God in that day. And look what verse 3 says. He was clothed with filthy garments, and as he stood before the angel, God said, Take away the dirty garments, put on him a clean robe, and I have told everyone in this court, I have caused your iniquity to pass away, and... I will clothe you with what? A change of raiment and a new robe. Now I want you to look at the passage I've got up on the uh, whiteboard just in front of you. <laughs> the whiteboard is <laughs> giving away the baby boomer days, isn't it? Zechariah 3, 4. Walking in white is your birthright. The devil wants to stop your birthright. Walking in white will give you confidence when you come to serve God. The devil wants to rob your confidence. 
Walking in white will bring you authority to stand and serve God. Walking in white is the key to serving God. And if you look at it further, if you go down to verse 7, Joshua, if you will walk in white, is my translation, if you will walk in my ways, and if you will keep the responsibility and the charge that I'm giving you today, here's my promise to you. You shall judge my house. You shall be a priest and a prophet and a king and a restorer. You shall keep my courts. You shall help people in the courts of God. And also I'll give you a place in the heavenly courts and you shall have counsel with God and you shall have work among men. What an amazing thought. Now, let's just pause there. How many of you have had a call of God on your life? You want to serve God. The great key is to walk in white. Would you flip over to the book of Revelation? And let me give you the New Testament picture. It should be somewhere there about Revelation 3, 2. Revelation 2. He's writing to the church at Sardis. And if you look at verse 3 of chapter 2, Revelation, the very last book in the Bible, look what God says if you overcome. Remember how you've received and how you've heard and hold fast and repent. If you won't watch, I'll come on you like a thief and you won't know what hour I'll come upon you. But you have a few names in Sardis. They have not defiled their garments. And what shall they do? We're looking at verse 4. Revelation, sorry, did I say 2? Apologize. It's chapter 3. Chapter 3 and verse 4. What is the promise God gives? You have a few names in Sardis. They have not defiled their garments. And what is the promise? They shall walk with me in white. Mm, absolutely fantastic because they are worthy is that worth preaching or what wouldn't it be fantastic Kathy would you stand up this is a white robe thank you for being a sermon illustration turn around this is the blood of Christ the red on white sit down <laughs> one day when you stand before the Lord you won't be in Gucci you won't be in sassafras or supre or whatever it might be I won't be in some somebody told me it looked like BJ2 bananas in pajamas today <laughs> thank you whoever that was and I deserved it Mike because I said you look like a tablecloth so I apologize humbly <laughs> and I will never ever use this pulpit as a coward's castle let me assure you but one day do you realize ladies do you know what it's like when you have got brand new clothes and you just feel so good and you're swan out under the catwalk, and everything's cut beautifully, it falls properly. Men, do you know what it's like to go and get ready for a wedding or to go to a special thing, and you've got a brand new suit? Don't you feel just something else? And you realize what it means that I will give you a change of raiment. Back in Zechariah, I want you to give him a change of raiment. I want you to give him a new robe. I want you to give him the capacity to know who he is, and whenever the devil tries to come up and drop the thoughts in the ear and in the heart, you know that that's not God, that's Satan. Yesterday I was getting ready to preach. I felt the most incredible onslaught of unworthiness. It just came out of nowhere. I felt like an attack of depression. And by the way, I'm reasonably Irish and I'm not a depressive person. And I recognized straight away that God was telling me, this is how the devil works. That's not me. That's of the devil. And when you preach this tomorrow... I want you to tell someone in your congregation, that's not God. That's the enemy. I think probably one of the most wonderful things you could ever have. Can we go back there, Jerry? We seem to have lost that one. I want to go back just a slide if it's somewhere in the world. Yep. I want you to go back to Luke 15, and here's where I'd like to finish. He came to himself and he said, pigs eat, servants eat, and I am a son and I'm starving. Many years ago, David Wilkerson said, I prophesy that the media will get so bad that when people sit down and watch television and go to movies, he said, I saw it was like green slime came out of the TV set and went shh, pfft, and hit them in the heart and in the head. And it polluted their minds 
and it stopped them walking with God. Now, if he came back today, he'd have a lot more to say. If you were eating pig swill, if you were feeding your heart and mind on stuff that you shouldn't be feeding your heart and mind on, you were eating pig swill. You were made for the bread of heaven. You were made for holiness and righteousness. Do you know when I'm getting this ready this morning, I put down my Bible, I walk upstairs. My wife's just came at half past six from work. We walk upstairs, give her a morning peck and hug, admire our flowers, take her inside. She throws down the courier mail on the table and it's got just salacious headlines, just dirt all the way through. Media love dirt. God loves purity. If you are putting pig swill into your heart and mind, you need to come to yourself. I remember once when I was going through a difficult slog of my own personal life. And as I looked at my fact that I wasn't pleasing God and I was pleasing myself, I looked over the precipice of my sin and I thought, God, I don't want that. And I came to myself and I said, pigs eat, servants eat, and I'm a son? What am I doing eating pigs well? And I said to the Lord, I'm coming back. And look what happened. The father ran to him in verse 20. Isn't that a fabulous picture? Embraces him. Can you imagine old Abraham ben Eliezer? And he sees his son down in the distance, and he can smell him before he sees him. Look at the guy in the top photo. And in the cleanest clothes that the father just put out that morning, he runs down, he embraces his son, and he turns to his servants and he says, I want you to bring out the very best robe. Has anybody ever driven a Proton? A car called a Proton? Uh, I think it's a new brand. Is it a Mazda? I'm not quite sure. Proton means first. Bring out the Proton robe. Bring out the very first one in appearance, the most glorious you can find, and the very best robe that the Father can give. And so what does the servant do? I want you to imagine this with me. The servant runs inside. The oldest son is out in the field. He's doing all the hard work. The servant got the word, get the best robe. Who does the best robe belong to? The oldest son. He runs into the wardrobe. He grabs the eldest son's wardrobe with the big wide sleeves that signify leadership, the huge bands around the front, the front that signify hereditary, and the striped hems and the things that signify his Jewish legacy. And he rushes it out, and the father says, that'll do. Give it to the pig son. And do you realize Jesus did that for you? When everything in you smelled of pig's will, he ran towards you, embraced you, and found the eldest son's robe and said, it's yours. And all the way through the Bible is this amazing passage, give him a new robe. God would rather you be clothed than sin-stained. The other day I had a new t-shirt from India that Prasad had sent me. It's a really clean white thing. It doesn't have any seams. It's a seamless thing. I'm eating a pear and a big piece of brown pear juice drops here. And you know I can't get that stain out. So I'm trying a few more things. And the first thing you see when you see me in this t-shirt, you don't, the eye just goes straight to the stain. So I'm looking for the best stain remover in society to get that pear juice out. But I'll tell you something that's even more precious. And we're going to come around the table and we're going to celebrate it. I don't know one stain that this won't remove. I don't know one stain that isn't good enough for the blood of Jesus Christ to take and cleanse every sin in our life. And I'm asking you today, would you like to walk white with God? Put on a new robe. And if you will do that, let me tell you what I think will happen. God will start bringing people across your path that he wants to restore because you're walking white with him. God will bring people across your path. And young man, young woman, listen to me carefully. There's leadership on your life. You've got to walk worthy and you've got to walk white. And if you will do that, God promises Zechariah, if you will walk in white, you will have cleansing. Now let's come around the table with this lovely thought. Here's a picture of Isaiah. He is having an encounter with God that is just amazing. 
and he has such an encounter that he's experiencing what the Lord is saying. David had to put on clean clothes, and by the way, I don't want you to turn to it. Did you know the first thing that David did after he got off the throne? He humbled himself, he fasted and prayed for seven days, and after his child has died, do you know what it says he did? He put on clean clothes. And in that time, he writes Psalm 51. Be merciful to me, O Lord. How blessed is the one who's forgiven. When Isaiah has an encounter with God, Isaiah says, he's too holy. My lips are unclean. By the way, that doesn't mean he's got problems with swearing. It means that in Israel, somebody who kissed the idol had unclean lips. Thanks, Liz. It meant that if God was going to cleanse you, you had to be clean from the idols in your heart. Now, Isaiah wasn't an idol worshipper. There's only one idol that stops us worshipping God completely, and that's the idol of self. And you know the great task of being born again? It's to make you bend the knee before the sovereign. And the hardest thing in the world, in human nature, is to say, God, you are boss. We like the cleansing, but how many have found that even after you've been cleansed, <laughs> your greatest struggle is not can God forgive you, it's who's in charge around here. Is God my boss? And that's why in the book of Romans it says, if you will confess with your mouth that Christ has died for your sins, and you will believe in your heart that he's raised from the dead, but if you will confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord, Kyrios, boss, in Dutch, baas, where we get the English word boss from. You shall be saved. It changes salvation from a fire escaper policy to what can God do for me to God, how can I serve you? And in 1 John 1, 9, and I'd like to do something this morning as we just stand in God's presence. If we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now we take that for granted. You've been coming to the Lord so often and just taking forgiveness for granted. Don't let the devil make you flippant about it. This table is not an escape clause in an insurance policy. This is an invitation to walk in white. This is an invitation to walk with God, holy and right with God. This is an invitation to say, Jesus, I honor your blood I will not despise it, and I will love you because you gave your life for me. It's an invitation to take the bread and recognize that if it wasn't for our sin, Jesus' body would never have been broken, but for my sin. And I love that chorus we were singing this morning. We just come to him. Every part of amazing grace is ours, broken every chain with love and mercy. And I want you to take the bread and the cup. Let's eat the bread. Take and eat. This is my body. This is the symbol of my body broken for you. Let's eat in Jesus' name. Now let's not be in a hurry to take the cup. I just want you to pause for a moment. I want you to look up for a moment. Look at that picture. The angel comes with a coal from off the altar. And do you know why he caught the coal from off the altar? It's because the high priest had just been in and sprinkled blood on the sacrifice. And the coals, part of the sacrifice burning away, receiving the sprinkling of the blood. And Isaiah has such a confrontation with God. I want you to look at the scripture in the middle. He said, not only will I deal with your offense and cover it, I will also deal with your sin nature. And the, there are two different words in this verse. Your sin nature is taken away. And the offense that you've committed is covered by the blood. The two of them together... Anybody remember the old hymn, Rock of Ages, Cleft for Me? Let me hide myself in thee. Let the water and the blood 
from the wounded side which flowed, be of, son, be of sin the double cure, cleanse me from its wrath and its power. And we're going to take this. I want you just to apply it. And as you're about to drink, just say, Lord, I want to please you more than I want to please myself. And the next time the devil tempts you and finds just the right shaped bait and the right size hook, and James says when you're led away in sin and tempted, it's only because of what's in your own nature. I want you to recognize what God said to Isaiah. I'm going to work on your sin nature, and I'm going to cover your sin. So we're going to drink in Jesus' name. Amen.